and I want to welcome everybody. Thank you for taking time out of your schedules to join us for this presentation. And uh, the MSBA is very proud and grateful mm -hmm. to the ADR section for uh, pulling this presentation together. Uh, I know that there's been uh, a lot of interest in um, how to conduct your mediations online. And I'm gonna ask folks who are participating to mute your mics, close your mics and your cameras if you're not presenting. Um, uh, Jolie Weinberg is gonna be facilitating your presentation today. You've got very experienced mediators running the discussion. In addition to Jolie, you've got uh, Cece Pace and John Greer. And uh, I wanna thank the faculty for putting this presentation together again and uh, suggest that anybody that wants to submit questions, use the chat icon up in the right-hand corner of your screen. Looks like a talk bubble. And if you type in your questions, uh, faculty will be uh, answering questions um, at the end of the presentation. And at this point, again, thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. We've got almost 200 people on the line. Uh, so uh, we appreciate uh, the faculty's time and effort and the ADR section's time and effort in putting this together. And I'll turn this over to, to Jolie. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Andrea, and thanks um, to everyone. Hopefully I turned my microphone on, I did. Thanks to everyone at MSBA for helping us coordinate this. Um, I wanna welcome everybody. I know it's not a class day that a lot of people don't have to necessarily get up, but I think it's gonna be an informative session on mediation and how you can integrate it into your practice with all that's going on in the world today. Um, I'm a partner at Weinberg & Schwartz in Howard County. But more importantly, I'm the chair of the MSBA ADR section council. And this concept of doing mediations and collaborative work and other forms of dispute resolution actually is not that new to our group. We started working on this concept um, back last year when we did our seminar for the Chief Judge Bell, the spring seminar, and we actually have an entire um, segment scheduled for June for the Ocean City. Um, presentation. I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but our segment is on ODR. And I will use ODR interspersantly through this seminar, through this presentation. It's online dispute resolution, just so everybody knows it's the idea of being online and doing mediations and collaborative and alternative dispute resolution type concepts. Um, my topic is going to be preliminary considerations um, for conducting ADR remotely. CC will follow up, CC Pays will follow up with the ethical and practical considerations. And um, go ahead, you can, you can flip the slide, um, Bill, we're on to the next one, I'm sorry. I have to get used to this whole slide concept. There we go. So CC will then um, talk about the ethical considerations. I actually think we're on to the next slide. There we go. Um, ethical and practical considerations. And then um, John's gonna talk about features to look for when you're doing video conferencing platforms. And um, as Andrea said, there is a chat box up in the corner, the right corner, there's already six different chats. I might be people saying good morning, um, but we will filter through those and pick out questions to address during the seminar, during the presentation. So we're gonna, we're gonna go on to the next slide, which is preliminary considerations. Oh, there we go. Um, yep. Of why conducting ADR remotely? Why even bother doing that? Well, it's kind of a duh question right now because we don't have many other choices. Um, with the COVID-19, we really can't leave our houses. And there's a huge safety factor to being able to conduct business and be productive out of our houses and doing it remotely. Um, what people haven't even thought about is that in certain circumstances, people don't want to be in the same room with other people, whether uh, domestic violence or um, just comfort levels. Sometimes uh, ODR is the way to go. But in today's climate, we don't really have a choice. So this is, this is what we have. And this is a way to keep your business afloat and keep things rolling, but also do it in a way um, that makes a lot of sense. So we're gonna try to give you the nuts and bolts today of how to make it work in your practice. Whether you're a mediator or whether you're a litigator, this can be integrated in to keep your business going. Um, the obvious 
um, advantage is convenience. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are in your pajamas right now. Good for you. I, I actually put on clothes today, first time in two weeks. I can't promise you that I don't have yoga pants on underneath or um, leggings or maybe even pajama bottoms, but it is way more convenient to be um, able to sit at your desktop or your couch and conduct business. It's comfortable, it's convenient. Um, and even though we can't really think about it today, it's cost saving. People don't have to fly in for a mediation. They don't have to um, take a train in. They don't have to take a bus. They don't have to um, go through toll booths. It's, it's, a, it's a really economical way to do business. And it's extremely accessible because most everybody these days has their ability to use a computer or get on their um, cell phone, laptop, what have you. Um, it's, it's a great way to practice law. And I, I have a feeling when this is all done that this will definitely change the way we practice law because people will have used this platform. They'll have figured out that this does work and there are other alternatives other than a face-to-face -face meeting. And I think even people that are doing um, depositions and other forms of, of uh, law practice are finding this works. Uh, moving to the next slide, Bill, thank you. And I didn't say accessibility also for handicapped people. So people that have um, limited mobility, this is also a great way to, um, to be able to to, to work through the issues. So the advantages of ADR are, <clears throat> well, the duh, the duh advantage is that if you don't do ADR, your practice is probably stagnant right now, that this is the best way to get people to the table to talk about working things out, to try to resolve cases. And this is not just um, family law, this is personal injury cases, it's workers' comp, it's estates and trusts, it's tax cases. Anything that has you know, your business going can be discussed and talked about through this process. Uh, video conferencing online, it, it is the next best thing to be in there. And we were just saying, John, Cece and I, the other day when we were prepping, that I don't know if um, this won't be something that's just really, really common now, that people will use this as a, as a means to work out issues rather than having to facilitate a get together, which takes a lot of time and a lot of energy. You can see facial expressions, you can see body language. There's so much that can be um, accomplished through online dispute resolution. One of the things I, you need to think about is not everybody that you deal with and work with has a techno technological ability to figure things out. There are some older clients that just have no concept. Uh, there is a way, and I've done it before, where you can have people available by phone that can't maybe do the technological aspect of it, but other people available by remote. And you can just kind of facilitate both different processes and be flexible. I think flexibility is really important today because uh, we're, we're in unchartered navigating these crazy waters that we never thought we'd be in. Um, the disadvantages, next slide, Bill, thanks. The disadvantages of, of ADR, remote ADR, is <clears throat> the environment you cannot control anymore. So you have no idea what's going on uh, outside of your realm of your, of your office, of your area where you're conducting the ADR. So for all you know, <clears throat> and this is for practitioners too, your client could be on the ADR call and they could have their whole family in the background um, giving them advice. You could have um, the children in the background listening to what's going on. There's no way to really know what's happening. And you know, we can ask people to not have other people involved or not be um, listening in. And Cece will talk about it in the ethical part of her, of her segment. <clears throat> so that's something that you won't know about. Um, there's also issues of confidentiality and privacy. Again, Cece will discuss this, but that's a disadvantage. There's, there's some issues even that John will talk about with Zoom and the confidentiality of being on um, some of these online platforms. And, and that's something we don't know about. And it's, again, it's we're, we're diving into areas that are now <clears throat> gonna be big issues for, for the future. And the other disadvantage is not being able maybe to have the time and ability to educate 
um, clients about what the expectations are. Um, when I do a mediation, I bring everyone into the room and I <clears throat> go through the agreement to mediate and I talk through all the pieces of it and I make sure everybody understands it before they sign it. Well, now that I'm doing online, I make them sign it before they even get onto the phone call because they have to, from the get go, agree that they're going to um, keep it private and confidential and it's not going to be going <clears throat> beyond the conversation in the room. So that's something that's signed and dealt with early on. So those are the disadvantages. You have to weigh them out, but right now I think the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. Um, initial questions for attorneys and for the clients, um, and this goes on to the next slide. Thank you. So I always tell people we're, we're on this, this platform, this um, online platform, whether it's Zoom or whether you're on Google Hangouts. And I just say from the get-go, look, this is a new process and there might be some things that don't work and you have to kind of work through those. Uh, I had a mediation last week where for some strange reason, my camera, um, not my camera, my speaker didn't work. And my speaker always works. I've never had it not work. And all of a sudden, oops, I had to um, figure out another way to deal with it. And that consisted of me calling both um, participants and putting them on speaker. And we figured it out. And there were some glitches in it. But you have to acknowledge that technology is not the same thing as being in the same room with people and not having to worry about speakers and lights and echoes and you know clarity. Um, the wonderful thing about some of these platforms, which I use Zoom and, and John's going to talk to you a lot about Zoom, is the ability to do breakout rooms. And that gives the mediator or whoever's conducting the ADR a chance to talk to the parties outside of the main room. And by doing that, you can have an opportunity to talk to each party separate and apart, not in the same room. <clears throat> and that's a really, really good advantage of having the breakouts. Um, doing that, you can also screen share. Uh, we were discussing the issues and the issue of child support came up and I was able to hop onto my child support guideline worksheet. I was able to do the numbers. I was able to flip it over and let everyone look at it. I was able to play around with it when people talked about different, um, different things that could or could not happen. Maybe there's not as much overnights, maybe there are less overnights, maybe somebody did get their bonus this year or they didn't get their bonus. So we could play around and do it in, in, um, in constant time of exactly when we were discussing it. We didn't have to wait, we didn't have to do it at a later date. <clears throat> you can also do a whiteboard, which is nice to put down issues and, and write things up while people are talking. The agreement to mediate, I, again, I explained you should do it before the process starts. Um, <clears throat> it'd be great if the attorneys who are working with the clients could spend some time going through it with their clients before the ODR starts. Um, lawyers can do a lot of things to get their clients ready for the ODR process. And if clients, if attorneys think they're losing business, they're really not because mm -hmm. clients want attorneys available and around and able to help them. So. The, the attorneys are going to do more than ever because they're going to prepare the clients for the sessions. They're going to get them ready. They're going to go through um, agreements to mediate. They're going to talk about the issues. So, and they're going to be in the room, hopefully, during the mediation. So it's not going to take away business. If anything, it's going to get um, more business because it's going to allow everybody to be involved. Um, and I tell people, really, really think long and hard about what you need to be prepared for before the session starts. The more prepared you are, the more confidence the clients have that this is a good process and they can buy into that this is going to work. So think through things. Think through like what we did before we even had our session today is we did a, a, a trial run. We did a, a remote control, a remote session. We um, made sure that we knew exactly what was going to go on. We made sure our speakers work. We made sure the clarity work. We made sure the backgrounds work. And we tweaked things before um, we came on today <clears throat> to make sure that everybody was fully prepared and had the best presentation possible. Well, mediation is the same thing. The more you can get done ahead of time, the easier it's going to be to have the process go smoothly. Um, 
even setting up break rooms, the breakout rooms, I do that before the mediation starts. I set them up so that it's not an issue and I don't have to waste time trying to figure out whose um, email goes with which room. <clears throat> so if you can think things through, even before the, the ODR starts, you'll um, have a client who knows that this is now your new norm and it's working and it's happening and it's great. So those are things to think about. Um, going on to the next slide. Some initial questions that attorneys and the clients need to think about, which is how tech savvy is your client and can they do this online and maybe they need a trial run before it starts. Um, do attorneys and clients have the right equipment, make sure everything works? One of the things I've learned is I probably need a better um, camera because mine's a little hazy. Make sure you have the right internet connections, laptops, phones, et cetera. Next slide. And make sure that you can sign documents remotely. Uh, there are a bunch of different uh, programs and platforms to use and you um, can learn about those. I've never done so much um, YouTubing as I've done in the last week. Uh, even with Zoom, I YouTubed about five different YouTube videos um, just to make sure I was understanding every single tool that was available in the toolbox. So <clears throat> be aware of these, um, be aware of the changing laws. I know that Governor Hogan just allowed us to have notaries without the notary being in the same room. So we can now do virtual notaries. That's good to know. Um, that's going to change <clears throat> some of your practice. Uh, make sure you keep a calendar for your scheduling. Um, there's a lot of great calendars. I know John will allow people to schedule online. Um, I won't do that, but I talk to people by email and I schedule <clears throat> by email just so I can clear my calendar out. Uh, next slide. Oh, an important piece to remember, how are we going to get paid? That's really important. Uh, again, there's different places you can um, get online with. I, we use LawPay. Some people use PayPal. There's a whole bunch of different options. I also um, didn't do this before, but I have people pay before the mediation. So two hours payment is due before the mediation commences. I think we're down to the last slide, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, helpful websites. And this is going to be on um, the AB, the MSBA website, so you can listen to or hear the um, today's presentation again, and you can also get the resources. So these are just some websites that uh, that might be of interest to people. And I think that that might be my last slide. Is there any more after that? That's me. Okay, that's my last slide. It was nice talking to you all. I'm going to turn it over to John now. That, um, I, I think I'm next. Sorry, Cece, you're um, next. Sorry. We also were going to do some questions. The one thing I wanted to note is we have about 244 people on this seminar. Um, the platform we're using is Google Hangout, which is what the MSBA uses. And I think some of what um, we some of what Jolie talked about already was raised in this uh, process. A lot of people couldn't hear um, Jolie. A lot of people couldn't see the the um, the slideshows. The slideshows. Sorry, the slides. The the PowerPoint presentation. And this is an example of learning the technology as we go. In some ways, um, this platform has Bill Hall, who is with the MSBA, um, advancing all of the slides. Um, and one question that did come up that I wanted to make sure um, I was the one monitoring the chat room was about separate mediations. And we'll talk about that. And I think John uh, Greer will deal with that in his portion. Um, mine, my section is about the ethical considerations of online uh, mediations. And while they're the same, if you would advance the slide, please. Um, they are the same. They do create a new emphasis on knowing 
your platforms that you're using. And if everyone understands when we talk about platforms, we're talking about either Zoom, Google Hangout, you know, WebRx, or I don't think it's WebRx, but whatever the WebEx, and some of the other ones that are out there go to meeting. You need to know where the um, points are that are that information could accidentally be shared. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. It also means you have to have competency. And I, there's an N in my competency for some reason. Yeah, so I misspelled it. I apologize. Um, the, um, because we need to be competent as mediators. And then self-determination takes a new, um, a new twist to it sometimes when you come to this uh, online process. So the one thing I do want to say preliminarily is technology is wonderful until it doesn't work. And I think that's been experienced by a lot of the people trying to get on to this um, seminar. It also is something you need to be very aware of. This morning, I almost had a meltdown because I could not get onto my email. And so if I can't get onto my email, I couldn't get onto my link to get to the seminar. Um, the end around was me calling Jolie in a panic and saying, can you send me the link on another email um, on my Gmail account? And that resolved it. But you need to be prepared for those kinds of glitches. I'm gonna to have to figure out why I can't get to my own email later. And I just wanted to bring that up as a, I consider myself older and that's as far as I will go. And some of this is hard for me to understand. And so I spend a lot of time as Jolie did on learning how to do the platform that I am using. And I do use Zoom. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things that will probably all three of us will say um, so that you can, so it is repeated numerous times. When I took my mediation training with Melanie Vaughn, she said you had to repeat things about seven times to have people remember them. We'll only do it three times. The biggest thing I think you need to do preliminarily is make sure that you have sat down and you've written out for yourself how you would explain the online platform you've chosen to use, how it preserves confidentiality, how the caucus process will work, um, and explain that there's no platform that is 100% secure. There are all sorts of ways. My, my theory has always been um, people will, will use their great intelligence online for evil rather than for good. There's nothing we can do about that. But also most of the breaches of confidentiality end up being created by the user themselves. Um, the one question I've gotten already from people is whether or not um, a non-invitee can use a link to get into the sessions. On the Zoom platform, it's controlled by the host. So the answer is no, no one can get in unless you admit them to the session. But that doesn't mean that, um, you know, as Jolie indicated, there not, might not be people off camera. Um, next slide, please. The biggest thing we can do is really emphasize the responsibility of the parties when they are participating in this platform. Make sure that people understand there shouldn't be anybody off camera. There shouldn't be anybody able to overhear the session. You cannot record the session. I actually had someone a few years back recording the session uh, with his phone under the table. And of course, you know, as cell phones develop over, developed over time, that was a new problem in person. Um, and no screenshots of the session can be taken. The key thing is you're not going to know whether or not people are doing that. That's something, again, as, as Jolie indicated, we can't control on the online platform. Next slide, please. With the ground rules that are established, and I think there are any number of them, I'm willing to um, provide to um, Andrea 
uh, Terry the my set of ground rules if she wants to send them out to people. But there are two ways that you can do this. You can send the gr ground rules um, to the parties as an attachment to the agreement to mediate. Um, or you can include them in the agreement to mediate itself. I send mine as an attachment because um, I don't want to over overwhelm my agreement to mediate. I do primarily family law matters. I do do all sorts of other cases as well. But um, in family law, the biggest thing I like to make sure is that people have read the agreement before they come. Um, and I also um, explain it to them again when they come online. So I conduct my mediations much the same as I did prior to this um, stay in stay at home kind of situation and doing it online. Although I do put more emphasis on, you know, between the parties, not between the parties and some hidden person off camera. Next slide, please. As, as um, has already been said with competency, you have to know your platform. The biggest thing that you can um, create is a sense of, of distrust or discomfort in a party if you're suddenly fumbling online. If something goes wrong, and it could, I had a case where um, the, the one party could not get out of the breakout room. <laughs> and I had to figure out how to get her out of the breakout room um, or what it was that wasn't being done at her end to allow her to get out of the breakout room. And I just had to take some time, go back into breakout, explain to her what she needed to look for, much like what Bill Hall is doing with people today about turning off your cameras and turning off your, your microphones for this process and then get them back in. It's about how you move them beyond the glitch that can be very helpful and, and be a positive. Again, you have to know the disadvantages of your platform. Um, for example, on Zoom, you have to be very careful with the chat function because you can accidentally take a chat that you were using in breakout room and suddenly it's available to everyone. And that of course is a disclosure that probably the person um, in, that you were chatting with would not want divulged. Um, and again, controlling through the side comment features of the chat is a really important one. And you need to know what that, how that process works in your platform, because that's where the pitfalls can come in. Next slide, please. Um, I don't know. I just need to ask this question. Competency is misspelled, isn't it? No one needs to really answer that. You could send a note. Okay, Susan, thank you. You said it is. I have an X pen in there, and I'm not sure why it continued through That's my, my fault. That's my fault. I'll take ownership. I'll fix okay. it. Okay. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Um, educating the parties on the technology before the session, I think, is important because um, they need to know what they're going to start doing. I think you also need to know what technology. Um, works for them. Are they going to be on a smartphone? Are they going to be on a, a laptop? Are they going to be on a, a, a desktop computer? Uh, what Do they have a camera? Do they not have a camera? Ask those questions or have them inform you before the session begins if there's a problem with any of that. Um, and again, know what to do if the technology doesn't work. Um, you know, have, have um, a way to get to someone you know, like I did with Jolie, to get the information. Thank goodness. Um, and but and often people will say, well, why don't we use this platform? I would strongly suggest that you pick one or two platforms and you stick with them. And if the person that is it may be participating in mediation suggests another one, and that's the only one they're willing to use, don't do the mediation because that could get you into a setting where things are being um, revealed that shouldn't have been revealed. You need to be able to have used it and practiced it before you use it in a session. 
Next slide, please. And again, ultimately with self-determination, the participants are the ones that make the final decisions. Um, and in the ODR world, this is both on whether or not to use the technology at all, if they're not comfortable, and which platform to use. Um, and if they choose a platform that you are not comfortable with, then you simply have to refer them to someone else. Or I don't even know what platform some people are using, so I would, I would just simply say, you're going to have to research that. And if I can be of help in the future, let me know. Again, do not use a platform you are not familiar with. I think it's very important that everyone really get to know the platform. You're looking at someone who was drug into this kicking and screaming. I've been playing with it for years, but I never really felt like I wanted to jump into it until I had no option. And I think that's where um, most of us are today. Self-determination is something that's important all across the, the, the mediation spectrum. Next slide, please. Um, I will tell you one thing, try to have as few distractions as possible for you. Um, because one of the things that I'm finding as an older mediator um, is that I'm easily distracted by the, the email messages that seem to pop up in the corner of my um, screen when I'm on a, a Zoom mediation. Try and see if you can figure out a way to minimize those. Um, my sister and I say we have the squirrel syndrome where if there's a squirrel over there, we look. And that's something that I think is not going to be um, endearing to the people that you're working with. Um, if you can, before so, uh, you have a mediation, encourage the parties to try out the platform to be used before the session if possible. You know, confirm again that the participants are going to have a, an access to a closed internet connection. One of my ground rules is do not use an open internet connection, such as what you can get at Starbucks. Um, confirm if someone is using a smartphone, because sometimes that technology can present a different look um, and a different sound. Um, just so that you know when people are getting on, if there's an issue about uh, clarifying the images that, that people have that are that are being presented to you through their camera um next slide please this next one check your background for any one un unwanted items I, it's important because that can be distracting to the people online the funny thing is i was just watching it um i can't remember which station it was but they had someone presenting on if you do online meetings you need to be clear about, you know, you need to have no distractions. And she was presenting it in front of a bulletin board with all sorts of pictures and notes and everything all over it. Be aware of that. Try to not have something in the background. I pur purposely set up my camera so that you can't see my bookcase behind me um, because it, it, I tend to like putting out photos and things of that sort. Just be aware of that and have the people that are are working with you aware of that as well. Um, make sure that you have the camera at eye level. You can put it on a box or a stack of books if you need to, but it's better to be straightforward and eye level. Um, I have found that on occasion, I have had the, the camera back too much and people are looking up my nostrils. So not the best way to, to, um, to proceed. The lighting is very important. I have a um, actually a, a desk lamp to my right so that you so I am front lit versus being backlit. If the participants are backlit, let them you know ask them to move so that you can see their faces. The whole point of this is to get as close to being one on one online as possible. And if you can't see them, you're not going to be able to see the visual cues. Um, the microphone on most laptops or smartphones should be sufficient. Um, if there's a problem initially, address it. If you cannot hear the people or they cannot hear you, address it at the beginning of your session. And the one thing I will tell you is that um, in the right lower corner of my um, laptop screen is a little speaker 
And I can't tell you the number of times I forgot to, to unmute that when I was um, preparing for a mediation session. And um, they do like to hear what you have to say, usually. Um, the next slide, please. The last two slides are what I've been doing research on, on doing online mediation. Um, ACR Hawaii did a project in 2013 um, related to this. And what they came up with was some lessons. Um, and I thought they would be an interesting way to end my portion of this. First, online mediators need to master the software and platform they use. Clearly, that's a theme throughout this presentation. Mediation skills and experiences are much more important than online mediation technology. It, it's important to know that you are still the key factor in this and how you apply your skills online is more important than the actual underlying technology. That's why we can do telephone um, mediations with success. Online is the same way. Again, we're, con we're always learning more and more about our platform and, soft and process. In this case, our, the mediator's learning process apparently can be considerably um, accelerated because of the online access to information about the different technologies. Next slide, please. And again, mediation by video, telephone, email, or face-to-face mutually exclusive. If we start online and we need to follow up with telephone um, or you know, if we start online and now and it opens up and we go to face to face. Um, looking at the, this uh, project shows that there are really different tools in our toolbox. And finally, online mediation can open up all sorts of new markets for opportunities for us as mediators. And TC, before you, um, oh, I'm sorry. I'll let you finish, and then I, I want to jump in with two things that people said. Oh, no problem. Um, just the last slide. It's about me. <laughs> so go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Julie. Okay, so there were two really good comments. Victoria said you can turn off notifications, which she's right. And that's one of the settings that you can do. And we all, I forget to do that. And that's a brilliant idea. The other thing that maybe you should address real quickly is somebody talked about virtual backgrounds. Do you have a, any input on the virtual backgrounds? Well, I think that the, um, the answer to that is each platform provides for virtual backgrounds that I each that I've looked at. Um, and it's just a matter of whether you're comfortable putting up a virtual um, background or not, and then whether your platform permits it. Uh, uh, I just try and make sure I set up my room. John, do you have something on that? Yeah, let me jump in. Uh, on Zoom, uh, I played around with the Zoom virtual background. Uh, it, it, you can get it as a feature. Um, if your uh, equipment is relatively new, um, you can just enable it. Uh, if you have an, a little older model like I do, um, the system requires a green screen. You have to have a, uh, a, a screen or a light colored background and then the uh, virtual background will work. Otherwise, uh, you, it just gets pixelated. There's a couple more questions and maybe we hit those before we jump on to John's. Um, and I think it's, it's probably worth um, discussing do you um, have any input on using ODR for pro se or self-represented litigants? Any thoughts about that? Um, when they are involved, the pro se, I think it's, the, it's no different than it is if you're face-to-face -face or um, I've done a lot of pro se litigants where one person's in California and the other person here. Um, the the answer is i think it's no different than a, a an in-person mediation and how about if somebody breaches the confidentiality such as you know somebody read over your agreement to mediate and they got your rules and yet they still breached what they were supposed to do somebody asked are the, are the lawyers liable for their clients misbehavior how do you handle that 
so now that's a question about whether or not the mediator, but the lawyers are liable. Um, I mean, I would not have an answer on whether or not the lawyers are liable, but um, I would I would anticipate that there are going to be people who are doing that or that don't disclose something at the beginning that they know would upset um, the other participants. Um, at that point, I think it's the same as an in-person. If there is a breach of the confidentiality, um, you have to decide whether or not the mediation can proceed. And if you feel that it can't, then you deal with it from that perspective. And then the another good another good question was, how do you deal with um, people that maybe want, don't want to do, and I talked about this a little bit, they don't want to do in person, they want to do online, they maybe want to be on the phone. How do you deal with people that some want to be on the phone, some don't, some want to be online, some don't want to be online? How do you deal with that? I just simply try to be quite honest with you, talk to them about having a consistent technology. If it's telephones, I don't do email mediations, um, so I wouldn't speak to that, but um, I try to encourage everyone to do the same, um, which means that maybe someone comes in person and someone's um, on camera. To me, that's the same. Having one person on telephone and one person on Zoom would be a last resort for me. I do try to work with people and get them to use the same technology so that nobody feels disadvantaged because there's a definite imbalance of power in different ways between a telephone and uh, a visual. There's a lot of questions about will they will people be able to get these slides? <clears throat> the MSA will make them available and they'll make this, they're making a video of today's chat and the um hall so it will be available for viewing on a, at a later time uh one more question, cc that is a good one is uh domestic violence how do you handle people um with those issues i think the easy one is if you're online it's really not an issue but i guess somebody's saying you know how do you deal with that issue I, I mean, I would deal with it in the same way I would with in person, and that is look for the imbalance of power. Um, I've not had that situation in a um, in a video mediation as yet, but my sense would be that the distance would would hopefully balance that aspect out a little bit more, since they're each in their own locations. Um, one quick question that I did see pop up that I wanted to kind of um, speak to, there were two things. One is separate caucuses. Um, that's part of knowing your, your, your um, platform and how many breakout rooms, they're called breakout rooms, mm -hmm. you can create. And whether or not those are um, basically controlled by the host so that people um, cannot move from one breakout room to the other without the host permit. That's very important. A lot of people do mediations totally in caucus, and that's why knowing your platform is so important. Because, um, for example, um, when I do my caucuses, I have people in breakout rooms, and I can move between the breakout rooms, um, and, and they are mutually exclusive exclusive as far as audio or visual and neither party can come into the other breakout yes. without me moving them there so um so it's important to know that platforms do permit for separate mediations you know um in all sorts of settings you need to know what your limits are and the number of people that can participate the number of rooms you can have <clears throat> the other one that came back that john i may you may be dealing with this as well but I wanted to make sure something was said. What do you use as a fallback? Do you use a telephone as a fallback if, if the technology fails? The first answer I would say is know how to reboot it and see if you can reboot it. And if I'm talking about rebooting. Um, so, um, I think, okay, Marvin, I think you do need to you can mute yourself and turn off your camera. Okay, thank you. Um, 
So the, uh, again, the key thing is to think these things through. And I think, John, you might be able to add to that because you usually do have a fallback if, you're, if your primary technology fails, correct? I do. Um, I do a number of things. Uh, I give I out my- should, I think we'll move on to John and let John go ahead and start his presentation. I think that makes sense right now. So we don't run out of time. Sure. Uh, let me just answer the that question. So I have I do a number of things. I give out obviously my email, my phone number ahead of time. Uh, if there's a and so if there's a problem, people can call me or email me. Now, what that means is mediators I have to uh, kind of look sideways uh, and monitor several different devices to see what's going on, and that's a little distracting. Um, I also give people the option to uh, phone in if the video fails. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say something about that later about th that's a little less secure uh, from a confidentiality, confidentiality point of view. Um, I also run a separate uh, computer in the background and in, I use Zoom as well. And I assign that as a co-host. I can create that as a co-host. And so if my primary uh, computer, which is my laptop goes down, um, the other co uh, computer remains running as the host, uh, a co-host. So um, that should hopefully prevent a uh, you know total loss of the session. Um, just before I start, um, there were a couple other questions uh, that came in, like how do you check in with parties if you're limited only to a telephone, if you don't have any video conferencing capability? I would say uh, either by, uh, probably by email. Right. If uh, if and that's what I said. If you have separate devices going, um, you would uh, you could email uh, somebody just to check in. If 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 you're on the phone with them, you you could have a have an email uh, open on the side. Um, there was also a question about online signing. I think Jolie covered that, and her slides will be available online. But there's things like um, DocuSign. Um, uh, ever sign. I use a program that I learned about from the MSBA uh, Young Lawyers section called 17 Hats. It's a fully integrated case management system, and I create documents online that permit um, uh, the parties to sign them electronically, forward them to clients, they sign it electronically, and it all comes back to me. So that's how I do it. Um, okay, so um, what I'm going to do is focus on features, and this is gonna be a little more technology. I'll try to keep it simple because I'm not a technology uh, guru, but um, I am gonna go into some of the features that uh, we think are helpful. So if you could do the next slide, please. Uh, so these are things you wanna be thinking about. Um, uh, you want to make scheduling your online sessions very easily, uh, very easy. Uh, a number of the platforms that I'll discuss in a, in a minute um, integrate with your um, your email, like Outlook or uh, or your Google Calendar, um, and they they quite a number of them have uh, buttons you can just click to schedule a uh, a session, an online session, and it's it's really really simple. Um, make sure that um, you know wh whatever platform you use has a, an ability to. Uh, provide the login information uh, to the parties. Um, and uh, there are some security issues that I'll cover in, in just a minute about that. Uh, we've talked about breakout rooms. Um, uh, in the nice feature is um, nice features are when you can set it up in advance, as we've talked about. But what I really like in Zoom is a feature that um, allows the participants in the breakout room to send me a message if I'm not in the breakout room with them. Um, and they can say, and this is very helpful in mediations. If you're in caucus, sometimes the parties want to discuss uh, things privately, attorney client, um, and then they contact me when they're ready for me to come in and give me the offer they want me to take to the other party. So, um, so look for that kind of a feature um, when you're thinking about which platform to use. Um, security, okay. so. Um, uh, there's this thing going on right now because Zoom is extremely popular. Um, of course, that's where the bad guys go. And there's this 
phenomena now called Zoom bombing, uh, where someone is able to hack the, uh, se the session and uh, post some really nasty stuff. Um, and it's possible if other, you know, it's, this is also possible on other platforms. So I'm going to give you some security tips that will uh, minimize the chance that this can happen. Um, one is that uh, you want a feature that will allow the host, i.e. the mediator, uh, to prevent the participants from joining the session before the, se before the mediator joins. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, uh, they're, they, they can't get in until you have uh, logged in. Um, another nice uh, tool that you might want to think about to prevent um, security issues is the ability to place participants in a waiting room, uh, or some platforms call it a lobby. Um, and then uh, they go in this virtual space. They can't get into the meeting until the mediator lets them in. Um, now, this is good not only for security, but also for um, um, confidentiality, competency, uh, and appearance of uh, impartiality. Um, you don't really want participants in the main session alone with the uh, mediator before all the participants are in there. So if you put them in a virtual waiting room, um, you can explain to them either in advance in your ground rules, or I even have text on my waiting room that says, uh, you're gonna be in here uh, until I admit you. Um, while you're in the waiting room, uh, you're not able to uh, converse with each other or with me. And I tell them why I'm doing that. And I tell them you won't be in there very long. Um, another um, tool that you should look for uh, to enhance security is the ability to lock the meeting. Uh, the host should be able to lock the meeting uh, so that no unauthorized people can get in. Um, there's some tips about scheduling. Um, when you're scheduling the um, online session, um, be careful uh, with your emails. Uh, don't um, widely broadcast your email invitation. Try to, to target it to uh, only the individuals that are authorized to come in. Um, uh, and uh, now it's, it's difficult to control an email once you've sent it. Other people can forward it. Um, but uh, hopefully, uh, you know, if you, if you impress on people <clears throat> in advance, like we've discussed, the need for security, um, they, they won't do that. Um, finally, the, the last clue that I'll mention, or excuse me, last hint that I'll mention is uh, providing parties with a password. Um, uh, what you really want to do is, uh, is, is, is have a password, but don't include it in your email invitations. Uh, what I do is I call the parties ahead of time and I give them the password over the phone. Uh, so um, hopefully with these kinds of security features, you won't run into um, hacking problems. Um, okay, uh, a really good feature that you would want to look for in, a, in an online platform is the ability to um, share uh, documents and applications online, or excuse me, on screen. Um, so this is really helpful when you're um, drafting an agreement, for example, or whether the parties um, need to share important information, like in a family law context, if you want to, uh, you could put up an Excel spreadsheet showing uh, finances. Uh, or um, the way I use it is uh, uh, I open a Word document on my computer, uh, I share the screen with all participants, and then uh, as we hammer out an agreement, I type it um, in the uh, screen share uh, application, i.e. in my Word, and, um, and then everybody can see it, all the participants can see it, and if I make some errors or if they wanna change things, we, we just do it right there on the screen. Um, another, um, another nice feature to look for is, is a whiteboard. Um, this is in the uh, screen sharing area. Um, uh, some, some platforms have a whiteboard that, uh, that the mediator can draw on or all participants can draw on. You can type into it. Um, it's really handy if you want to um, construct a diagram. Let's say you're doing a personal injury auto accident case. You need to reconstruct the scene of the accident just so everybody's on the same 
uh, uh, same sheet of music with the facts. So you can draw on the uh, whiteboard um, and uh, that can be saved. It can be saved in the cloud or it can be saved on um, the mediator's uh, uh, computer for added security. Okay, next slide. So now I'm gonna run over some of the uh, technology options. Um, uh, there are several things that are out there. Uh, these are some of the more popular ones. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, cover, cover these things. Um, so Google Hangouts, uh, this is what we're using now. Um, it's, part of, uh, uh, it's part of what Google calls the G Suite. Uh, the G Suite has a set of basic Google tools. Um, the cost for the basic version is $6 a month. The business version is $12 a month. Um, both of those services have uh, Hangouts uh, that'll take up to 150 participants per call. Um, it, it is integrated with the Google Calendar, so you can schedule meetings very easily. Uh, you can use it on an Android or, or an iPhone. You can screen share, you can group edit documents. You can store documents in a shared drive like Google Docs. Um, one of the main drawbacks, though, it does not have a breakout room feature. I could find one. Um, and also, when I've used it, um, I only get four thumbnail pictures of the participants at one time. Um, I stay in the uh, upper right corner. Um, and so for me, uh, only being able to see um, you know, four thumbnails at a time is, is, is not gonna be great when I have more than four people for a mediation. Um, encryption, again, I'm not uh, so sure it's, uh, uh, well, let me just say this. For encryption, uh, um, the most secure encryption that you can use is called end-to-end -end encryption. Um, and, and, and this involves, um, a, uh, a, a generation of a private key and a public key such that um, the sender and the recipient are the only ones who can read the communication. Okay, so that's the most secure um, encryption uh, capability. Um, the other uh, type that's it's, uh, more prevalent probably is the transport layer uh, type of security, which means it's encrypted but um, the provider uh, can access it if they choose, uh, and they may be legally required to access it, access it and provide it to government authorities. Um, so um, uh, what I found on Google Hangouts is that um, they encrypt in transit, which means they're using transport layer security um, so that your messages are available to Google, and if Google gets a... Uh, um, a request from uh, from a lawful uh, uh, law enforcement authority, um, they have to turn it over. So just be aware of that as a as an issue for security. Um, okay, next I'm going to go to meeting. So uh, go to meeting has um, uh, HD video conferencing. The number of participants depends on the pricing plan. Um, the cost for a professional plan is $12 a month, and that gets you 150 participants. Uh, you can get a business plan for $16 a month, and that gets you up to 250 participants. Uh, again, you can use it on uh, both types of smartphones. It does have screen sharing. It does integrate with calendars for your scheduling. Um, and it does have end-to-end -end, uh, encryption. So this is really good for um, confidentiality. Uh, but I didn't find any breakout room feature on uh, GoToMeeting. Now, um, because of the end-to-end -end encryption, it's, you know, and if you're not going to do caucusing, perhaps this would be a good choice for you. I know a lot of mediators don't do caucusing, so, um, you know, that is something to consider. Um, the next one I want to talk about is uh, WebEx. And now, WebEx has uh, upgraded its free plan in the uh, in this era of the uh, coronavirus, um, they uh, they now have a free account that allows 100 participants. It was 50. Um, there there now is no uh, time limit on the duration. They used to have a 40 minute limit, uh, but during the the crisis, they they've taken that off. Um, 
you get HD video, you get screen sharing, whiteboard sharing. Um, starter account is $13.50 a month. Uh, it will integrate with your calendar. Um, and uh, uh, you can get a mid-sized team plan for $17.95 a month. You get a large team plan for $26.95 a month, and that gets you up to 200 per participants. Uh, it does work on the phone. It has breakout rooms. You can select you can select end-to-end uh, -end encryption for this, and you can put uh, people in a what they call a lobby to wait until the host admits them. Uh, and you can lock meetings. So this appears to be a pretty secure uh, uh, platform. Uh, I understand the Department of Justice uses it, and probably other government agencies. So that is something to, to consider. Um, there's a uh, 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 program out there called Slack. Um, I'll just mention it because it's good for teams. Um, instead of uh, organizing uh, communications by individual inbox, what Slack does is organize communications by channel, meaning that it's based on a team concept so that everybody on a team can see um, the communication. Um, and uh, it's important to note here, it does integrate with uh, lots of apps and services, including Zoom. So um, think about that. Okay, let me let me talk about Zoom. You've heard John, a lot did you about- save, Did you save the best for last? <laughs> uh, well, um, I've, you've heard a lot about Zoom. Uh, it is very popular. Um, it's the one that the three of us use. Um, uh, we could we could recommend it uh, for within certain limitations, and I'm going to go over those. Um, you can get what's called a pro account, which is a uh, pretty reasonable fifteen dollars a month. It covers uh, hundred participants. There is a free account, but that is limited to uh, forty minutes of use, whereas the pro account. Um, gives you sessions of unlimited uh, dur duration. Um, it does have a virtual background, as I mentioned, but if you don't have the, the most recent uh, equipment, you have to use a green screen, which I can I understand uh, from, from looking at the Zoom uh, tutorials is available on Amazon. I haven't done that, but okay. Uh, it has a waiting room. Uh, you can, as I mentioned before, you can put people in this virtual waiting room before you admit them. You can lock the session. Uh, you can uh, prevent participants from joining until the host joins. And that's another layer of security. It has breakout rooms, as we mentioned, screen sharing, whiteboarded, boarding. It does integrate with your calendar, so it's very easy to schedule. Uh, so I need to say um, a few words about um, encryption on Zoom. It does have end-to-end -end encryption for chat. Okay, so that is that is a feature. Um, the Zoom website says that you can enable end-to-end -end encryption for meetings. Um, but there have been articles out there by technical experts saying that uh, this may not be true, that they really, for meetings, only use transport layer um, uh, encryption, which again, uh, to, to, to recap, means that um, they can access it as well as any lawful government request. Um, now, Zoom has put out a statement that they have strict policies that uh, prevent employees from accessing uh, user data uh, unless they're lawfully required to do so. Um, and they say that they don't mine or sell the user data. Data. So <clears throat> I think, <clears throat> pardon me. I think the 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 bottom line to take away is that you, as we've said before, you have to know your platform. You have to know um, what the security protocols are. You have to really discuss it with the parties. Uh, for most cases, <clears throat> my feeling is that the Zoom security would be sufficient. Um, <clears throat> but if you have a very sensitive case, um, you know, perhaps trade secrets, perhaps um, highly sensitive uh, personal or health information, um, <clears throat> you, you know, the parties might want the highest security, which would be the end-to-end -end encryption. And in that case, you, you might want to consider a platform other than Zoom. But I think for the purposes uh, uh, that I use it for, 
um, I think my, my, most of my uh, parties would feel that it would provide sufficient um, security. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, so a couple of things, a few things we don't recommend. Uh, we don't recommend WhatsApp or FaceTime. Um, they do have good end-to-end -end encryption. Okay, so that's a good thing. Um, but uh, they don't have the features that are really useful for mediation like screen sharing and uh, breakout rooms. Um, the, also, the uh, WhatsApp is limited to four participants in a group video conference and uh, as far as I can tell, you cannot also you can't make a video call on a desktop. Um, FaceTime can only be used on a Mac or an iPhone, whereas a lot of uh, users have Windows, so that's a limitation. Um, we've talked about Google Hangouts Meet. Um, again, doesn't have a breakout room, doesn't have full attendee thumbnails, doesn't have end-to-end -end encryption. Um, so I would not recommend it for mediation at, on that basis. On Skype, um, it does have group videos with up to 50 people. It does have screen sharing. Uh, I think I would have concerns about the security. You do have to opt in for end-to-end -end encryption. Um, if, if you don't and, and somebody calls in from a landline or a mobile phone, that communication trans, uh, transits over the uh, public switch network, and that's not going to be encrypted. Also. Um, if you listen to a voice call with Skype, um, the, the call goes from Skype's server to your local machine, and uh, it's not going to be encrypted there. So um, I think we would probably not recommend using Skype. OK, next one. Next slide, please. Uh, backup plan. We've talked about this already, but uh, I'm just going to hit it again based on CC's uh, admonition that we need to Say it and say it again. Um, tell the parties in advance what your plan is. Um, first, try to uh, log in again using the initial instructions. If that doesn't work, call or email the mediator. And then you can always call in phone. But <clears throat> um, again, if you call in by phone, uh, you're on the public switch network, and it's not going to be encrypted. <clears throat> Last slide, please. <clears throat> so. Practice, practice, practice. Uh, you know, use use the uh, platform. Uh, try it out with coworkers. Try it out with family members. Uh, I can't emphasize enough the um, importance of uh, demonstrating your con competency, spelled correctly, and uh, because that just generates trust, both in you as the mediator and in the process. Okay, um, so <clears throat> parties should do that. Uh, ahead of time, they need to be comfortable. Now, what I do <clears throat> is uh, uh, I offer to um, run a Zoom practice session with the attorneys and the parties ahead of time. I've had people take me up on this, and it's been extremely useful. Um, we've uncovered all kinds of technical problems, um, which are, um, you know, you want to get those out of the way uh, before the session. You don't want to take 20, 30 minutes of your um, court-ordered mediation time, for example, to iron out uh, technical problems. Um, that does not uh, indicate that you're competent and it doesn't engender trust. Um, and as people have said, there's lots of YouTube uh, platforms. And there's lots of tutorials on each platform. OK, last slide is just me. There we go. OK. All right, so um, I was not watching the questions as they came in. I, I, I have my, a bunch of my questions. Colleagues are. Yep, I have a bunch of questions for you. Um, <laughs> people were asking about the free versus the paying for Zoom and the limits that you have, you know, mm -hmm. the 40 minutes versus unlimited. Can you talk about that for a second? Sure, the free Zoom, um, <clears throat> pardon me, is limited to 40 minutes. Um, and uh, I think I think you can get a hundred participants. Uh, I mean, I don't think I don't think the particip participant uh, limit is going to be a problem on the free account. the The main uh, difference is the duration of the session. You get unlimited duration uh, with the pro account for fifteen dollars a month. 
I would ask both Cece and John this question. Um, how would you change your agreement to mediate knowing that you now have security issues? How, how would you address that with your clients? What I say in mine is that the, um, uh, first I stress that there are always risks in uh, whatever platform uh, you use and that um, I indicate I will discuss those risks with the parties ahead of time and uh, then they will um, uh, be responsible for accepting the, um, the, the choice of the platform. Uh, I also have boilerplate language in all of my emails that say uh, I will uh, undertake uh, reasonable efforts to provide um, security for those communications, but by communicating with me by email, the parties accept the risk of disclosure. Um, CC, any thoughts? I know, uh, there were a couple people popping up saying that if you're the host, you don't have to worry. The participants don't have to pay. <laughs> We've got to say that. If you're a participant, the subscription, it's the host that need the subscription. And that's true. Correct. CC, what are your thoughts on the, how you would advise clients on security issues? Well, I basically um, have some language in my agreements, and then I also have some. Um, you know, conversations with them. So I have it in an email, I have it in my online agreement, um, and I have it in my introductory remarks. So um, again, it's it's an evolving thing. It's like any other contract that we seem to develop. It is that we, we find something that needs to be covered and we add to it. My concern in, is in my family law um, agreements to mediate. I don't want to overdo the language in the agreement itself. Um, so I try and almost bullet point those concepts and go over them more when I'm, I'm talking to them about what that means in the agreement. Um, with my commercial um, agreements, I'm not as concerned about the length of them because most commercial folks are used to us lawyers creating 20 page contracts over a one page concept. Mm -hmm. Just kidding, we're worth every word. So. There's been some comments, um, and this is more towards Andrea and Angela. People are saying, if we all want to get Zoom licenses, can MSBA look into coming up, whether we can get a group discount? I think that's a brilliant idea because I wish I would have invested in Zoom, you know, a month ago because everybody and their brother is using Zoom. But maybe that's something we can ask MSBA to look into to see if we can get a discount now that there's so many of us probably wanting to get licenses. They don't have to answer it now. We're just throwing it out there. Um, everyone's asking about agreements to mediate and your addendum CC. Would you be willing to share that information with the crowd? And would John, would you be willing to share it? I know I will. I'm fine with that. Uh, I'm fine with sharing. <clears throat> Change it though, because I like what John, how John just said the security piece about accepting the risk. So this is why it's always evolving, and we can learn from each other. We like to share, but we don't like to share the COVID-19. So that's one thing we're not going to share. Um, somebody asked, "How do they get back in the room, John? Once they um, once you put them in the breakout room, how do you get them back in?" The host can control that. Um, they, if let's say the client wants to talk with his or her attorney um, privately, so I leave. The, I have the ability to go in and out of the breakout room, so I leave that room, uh, and uh, so they can, when they're ready, they can send me an inquiry, and then uh, as the host, I have a screen where I can take them out of the breakout room. There was also a question about saving the whiteboard and saving um, the shared screen. Is that an issue that you're concerned about that people might take it and, and keep copies of it? Not you could both answer that. Um, I have not used a whiteboard yet uh, in my Zoom mediations. Um, my policy is that if I have something on a whiteboard and people want to take a photo of it, that I don't 
I will allow them to do that so that they can recall what's on the whiteboard. So I don't have a problem with people keeping <clears throat> or their notes or, or keeping that material. Um, if there's something that people do not want to be shared, that is something when you're in a breakout room, you have to be clear about and then make sure that you're not sharing a document by accident that you agreed you wouldn't share because you can collect documents in the background and go to share mm -hmm. document and click on a particular document, but they tend to be a little bit like thumbnails. And so you just need to be careful to make sure you know which document you're opening when you're either in main session or in a breakout room. So those are important things. I don't have a problem with it. Um, if with Zoom, if for example, I can see Jolie right now, she picks up a phone and puts it in front of, to take a picture of the whiteboard, I'm gonna know because I can see her. Um, but again, I don't have a problem with that. That's going to be particular to the participants and the, the actual material on the whiteboard. Yeah, I, I'm the same with CC, you know. Before I was zooming a lot, I would uh, use sticky uh, easel pad paper, you know, to write on. And if I needed more, I'd stick them up around the room, right? And then that was that was in joint session. And so anything in joint session seems to me um, capturable by the participants. And so when when I would stick the sticky easel board paper on the wall, people would take cell phone pictures of it so they'd have it for their future reference. And it, the whiteboard is exactly the same thing. It's just, a, now it's just online. And I think it's going to be whatever your policy is, you need to let them know at the beginning. Um, I do not know in Zoom where a participant can essentially do a screenshot of the, um, of a whiteboard. And I guess that's something that um, maybe John, you and I can take a look at. I've never had that question come up, but it would be um, it would be something that you need to set up as a policy beforehand. You can't do the screenshot. You can't, um, you know, the same as recording it. You know, you cannot keep a copy unless everyone agrees and, and you know, um, yeah, I I think I make that clear at the beginning. I'm not going to collect notes and tell people they can't keep what they want to keep. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a feature in Zoom uh, so that the host can turn off participant recordings. They, they don't have the ability to record. The host can turn that off. I think what's amazing about just us having this conversation and this presentation today is I'm writing down notes of things I didn't even know were cap mm -hmm. we were capable of doing. So I think that it's great to keep having these conversations and keep talking because we learn more every time we have these discussions. Um, somebody made a great point. I think it was Luann saying, wouldn't it be great if MSBA could get Zoom to do a webinar for our whole entire you know, group and they could deal with some of these issues. Um, like John and Cece said, Zoom is um, now people are doing book clubs by Zoom. They're doing happy hours by Zoom. They're doing um, coffee chats by Zoom. And you're going to learn the basics. But I think what we're all looking to do is try to get beyond the basics so we can help our clients use all the tools in the toolbox. Um, other questions? Um, it's, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of questions about security issues. And I, I think that we're gonna end up shaking, things are gonna get shaken out as we use it more and more to try to figure out how to, use, um, how to use Zoom. We're gonna also have people figuring out what works and what doesn't work. And there's always gonna be a few bad eggs. Any thoughts guys about this? That's gonna be an issue. Yeah, let me, let me just jump in. So, um, uh, I was the senior counsel at the National Security Agency, and before that, I was the cyber counsel for many years. Uh, and so, look, uh, no platform is 100% secure. Uh, everything has bugs, um, and it's 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 a cycle. Uh, platforms will find uh, bugs or or the bugs will be found by others, and the platforms will uh, issue upgrades and patches. 
uh, this is this is normal. This is the way uh, the industry works. Um, you know, uh, you so what I'm saying is you may see articles uh, that'll pop up about uh, bugs <clears throat> and weaknesses that are found in. Um, you know, it's going to happen probably more with Zoom because Zoom is much more in the public eye. Um, and, uh, you know, like a bank robber, where's the bank robber go? The bank robber goes where the money is. OK, so the bad guys are now going to go to Zoom and try to uh, take a really hard look at um, uh, all the uh, all the programming, all the protocols and so forth. Uh, so they'll probably find some weaknesses. Um, what we can hope is that Zoom will um, uh, become aware of those and will issue patches and upgrades. Um, so, uh, my, my, so my comment is uh, this is part of the world we live in and, uh, um, you know, it will, uh, it will happen. And, uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, there are there people find more bugs than, than uh, people are comfortable with, but um, they'll get patched. Michael, there's about nine, there's there's about nine minutes left. Does anybody have some burning questions they want to throw up on the chat um, before the our time is up? Does Google Hangouts have a whiteboard? Um, well, guys, the sample agreements. Don't worry about those. Thank um, you. I'm not. There was a question whether Google Hangouts has a whiteboard. Uh, <laughs> Bill from the MSBA. I don't believe it does. Um, you can share your screen and you could use an online whiteboard that way, but you can, but I don't think it has it built into the Google Hangout platform. Terry, there's one there for you about can CLE credits for this seminar. I think Hi, uh, this, Cece, if you were asking uh, uh, me to chime in on that, uh, we're not offering CLE credits for this. This is informational only. Okay, thank you. Oh, here's a good question. Do the platforms uh, require users to download and install programs? Um, I, can, uh, I would say generally yes. Um, certainly Zoom does. Um, it's a... Uh, Right, so the so the way it would work is that the uh, let's say you get a Zoom account and you've opted for the Pro account, um, <clears throat> you download software onto your phone and your computer. Uh, <clears throat> it's called client a client app uh, that gives you the ability to uh, uh, schedule meetings, uh, set security, and so forth. Um, then. Uh, if you schedule a meeting and uh, invite people, um, they, they would have to download uh, 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 an app to use it. Um, I have not run into any problems with anybody uh, downloading that app at all. I just, I send it to them um, and it, it, it seems to work fairly seamlessly. Just um that Aaron brought up, if you do the basic um, Zoom, it's uh, you only allow three people. So they, they do limit how many people you can have. It's 40 minutes and three people, according to Aaron. And I trust Aaron because she seems to be pretty savvy on Zoom. Um, I think most people are saying goodbye. So I think it's a good time to wrap up. We really appreciate everybody participating. There's going to be a coffee chat that's going to follow, put on the MS. For MSBA ADR, and that's actually run by Jeff Truman, who's a civil practitioner, and he's going to have Jim Matze and LM Biggs, um, who do a lot of different areas of, of family and otherwise. So that will follow, and that'll probably be in the next two weeks. Um, it's a hot topic, and I think it'll get more advanced as we do more of these chats, and it'll be more um, questions with more detail. But I thank you all for coming and sharing your morning with us.